All right, feel free to uh, finish up your, uh, your lunch, uh, but we're going to bring up our luncheon speaker. And we're very pleased uh, today to have uh, Mark McCullough with us. Uh, Mark McCullough is Executive Vice President of Generation, responsible for the management of, of AEP's fossil, hydro, and wind generating units. It includes engineering, construction, and operation of generating units and activities related to fu uh, fuel procurement and emission monitoring and logistics. Uh, the engineering projects and field services, fossil and hydro generation, fuels, emissions, logistics, and environmental services groups all report to Mark. So obviously very, very important both to AEP and for our discussion today. He's been with AEP for his entire career beginning in 1981. Uh, he is a member of the board of EPRI, uh, as well as uh, several local boards and commissions here in Ohio. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Rose Holman Institute of Technology. He's going to speak for a few minutes, and then he'll be glad to, uh, to take questions from you. So please uh, join us in welcoming Mark McCullough. Thank you, Doug, and what an honor it is to be here with you all. Um, my first observation is that I just lost out to the cannoli. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm sure folks will be back. But uh, what I'd like to cover today, uh, after a short introduction, kind of covering some basics about AEP generation, where we've been, where we're going, uh, I'll look at the role of markets. As you all have been discussing today, an AP perspective there, state initiatives and how that interplay from our perspective could be uh, very productive and uh, then kind of characterize some things into a category of concerns, needs, and challenges. Um, so thanks again. Really happy to be here. Uh, and I guess I'll start with kind of going backward, maybe six, seven, eight years. Um, AP was uh, uh, a company that held 40,000 megawatts of generation. Uh, contrast that to today, uh, we hold 26,000 uh, megawatts of generation. So what's the difference? Uh, about 7,000 megawatts of uh, coal plant ha has retired. Um, we have sold uh, about 5,000 megawatts of coal and gas uh, <clears throat> as we move out of our generation footprint in Ohio. Uh, so uh, it's, it's quite a bit different than it was just a few years ago, as you might expect. Um, so coal's role for us has changed dramatically. Uh, we were at about 70% of our capacity in coal about 15 years ago. Uh, today it's well less than 50%, and as we project out, you'll find out in a moment, it's going to be even much lower than that. Um, we recognize uh, the, the role of all generation it has changed just in the last five years, and we see it changing going forward as well. <clears throat> so we'll um, talk more about that, and I hope there are questions about that as we move toward the end. Um, and in the midst of all that change, uh, we've always been an advocate for uh, taking care of the uh, resiliency and reliability needs of the grid. And I want to talk a lot about that today as we talk about uh, transition. So environmental performance for a moment, I mentioned all that change has taken place in our generation footprint. Um, we did invest about $8.7 billion over the last 16, 17 years uh, in coal plant retrofits, um, and then more in new generation, mostly natural gas. Um, our emissions this year will, we're forecasting to be uh, 56 uh, CO2 emissions, 56 percent below what they were in the year 2000. SO2, NOx, and mercury emissions are all down um, 90 percent or more. Mercury is not quite 90, I don't think, but uh, it's in that ballpark. So that's kind of where we've been over the fat past few years. I'll talk just a moment about uh, what's ahead for us in terms of generation. Uh, when we look at the uh, combined effort of all of our operating companies and move all their integrated resources plan plans into one package. Um, it we 
we intend to, according to that plan, uh, build about 12,000 megawatts of generation uh, for the benefit of our customers. 8,000 of that uh, is planned to be renewable, and 4,000 of that is planned to be gas. And um, I would argue uh, that a lot of that gas will be not our traditional gas. Uh, as we look at um, more distributed models, perhaps, and uh, how we can best bring customer value um, in a number of different ways, and I'll talk more about that uh, here in just a little bit as well. Uh, so we get a lot of questions about, uh, okay, so why, why is it that all of this renewable generation is in the forecast? Well, I think there are three basic reasons. First of all, there uh, will be a carbon regulation. Um, we don't know what that will be, but uh, there will be one. EPA has the authority to um, rule over carbon, and they, they will do that. Second of all, our customers more and more desire. Many of them require a renewable energy. Um, we're ears wide open to that. We were with our fourth largest customer about this time last year where they told us their intent was to be 100% renewable by 2020. And uh, we're hearing more and more of those kind of stories uh, as we hold those discussions. So we're gonna get a carbon rule, customers desire, even require, uh, and the fact that it's very, very competitive. Uh, you may have seen, we announced uh, late July that um, we would be filing for a 2000 megawatt wind farm in the panhandle of Oklahoma. Uh, it's in the panhandle of Oklahoma because uh, it's a rich energy resource, wind energy resource of over 50% capacity factor. Uh, we will uh, likely invest in the neighborhood of four and a half billion dollars. Um, and uh, that energy, part of that four and a half billion is a 350 mile extension cord, if you will, uh, from the Panhandle to our service territory um, that will bring a rich energy resource, wind energy resource, to a region that does not have uh, a terribly rich wind energy resource. In the, in the process of all that, uh, the customer's monthly bill is going to go down, which is very exciting for us. Uh, high customer value, high value to the communities in the state, uh, so we're very excited to bring that project forward. It does need to be approved in four states, and we're moving through that process uh, as we speak. So that's a little bit about our future. Let me get to um, role of markets and the AEP perspective. Obviously, um, today in my business, our business, uh, it, it's a time of transition. We are moving from what was to what will be, and we're doing that fairly rapidly. And I'd, I'd take my hat off to PJM for recognizing um, that's taking place and some of the initiatives they've moved through um, and white papers they've delivered are recognizing the challenges of that transition. Um, but I, I tell you, many in the industry, including me as a, a life, lifer in the generation business, um, uh, our concerns with long-term tra trajectory and the uh, grid security associated with that. So, um, you know, a lot of owners struggle with uh, the capacity performance construct uh, due to its continual low clearing price. Um, that is an issue, and um, we'll we'll talk more about why that is an issue here in a moment. Um, and then, obviously, these state initiatives that. Uh, bring incentives for retraining uh, or retaining certain elements of generation in their states. So once again, the key word is transition, uh, and obviously we agree that uh, the the generation landscape is going to change. Uh, we're uh, waving a caution flag about how that done is support is as important as uh, what it looks like when it's done. Uh, it needs to be done in a very orderly, rational way, and uh, we need to be uh, in the spirit of maintaining reliability and resiliency. And um, I guess I could quickly define the difference uh, between those two. Uh, if you look at an individual asset, um, you, you might 
find uh, an asset to be uh, tremendously reliable. A natural gas combined cycle plant, and this is a product of uh, PJM's white paper, <clears throat> has very, very high reliability, perhaps 98% or above. Uh, that's different than resiliency when you look at the entire network and how we can assure that that asset will be there when it's needed uh, on the right day, in the right situation, no matter how dire and how demanding that situation is. Um, renewables are going to be a bigger and bigger part of our footprint. They're um, very, very welcome. Uh, as I just mentioned, we're pursuing those um, heavily. Uh, but we want to pursue them in a way that's integrated uh, and uh, recognizes these reliability, resiliency needs uh, because um, uh, wind and solar don't equal nuclear, coal, and gas for a number of reasons that are very, very obvious, intermittency being uh, primary among those. So in terms of markets and transition, um, markets should send both capacity and energy signals that reflect all the requirements of serving the load um, in a very reliable way. Accurate price signals can provide the maximum benefits for our customers and generators. So um, AEP is primarily a regulated utility. I think uh, all in the audience probably know that. Uh, but being regulated doesn't mean that we think markets are a bad thing um, or unnecessary. In fact, we believe uh, good market constructs can provide valuable price points um, and customer value if they're designed properly. And we wouldn't want to forget uh, the role of transmission. Uh, AP is the largest transmission owner in the, in the country and uh, we're working hard to make sure it's delivering, it's part of the reliability equation, uh, does relieve constraints where markets can bring congestion and new additions of generation, uh, new changes in uh, the landscape can bring congestion. Um, it can be relieved, uh, as we know, by transmission. Um, and so uh, just a caution not to forget the role of transmission in the overall uh, scheme of things. So let's um, focus a bit on shortfalls of the capacity market. Um, you know, it, it's uh, using the term market um, as, uh, especially around capacity market, is, um, is a little generous probably. It's a construct. Uh, it's an administrative, administrative construct um, that uh, is headed in a particular direction today. So I get asked the question quite often, um, what, how is the market working? In fact, I sat on a panel about a year ago with one, one of PJM's Grid 2020 panels and was asked that question. <clears throat> and my answer to that question is, it's working fairly well. Um, but if we were to start at ground zero and start over, uh, what generation would land in the mix? What would be awarded? What would find its way to uh, supply all of our customers? And I think the answer to that's fairly simple. Um, it would be all gas from a dispatchable perspective and filled in with some things around uh, the border because <clears throat> of the, the inherent advantages of natural gas um, generation today. So um, why is that a problem? Why is that a concern? And and I, I'll do my best to describe that from personal experience and otherwise. So uh, at, a, at a generating plant and in a transmission system today, even in distribution substations, we are required to follow a number of rules that uh, a, an organization called NERC requires us to. We uh, have quarterly uh, testing requirements that relays are going to do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it to keep um, the energy grid in service. We have very strong physical uh, requirements about who can enter where when uh, so that we don't see um, someone simply coming in and, and uh, making a disruption to the generation process or transmission process for that matter. Um, and the, the piles of reports that are registered with our, our local regional entity 
uh, is voluminous. We have several people employed to uh, take us through that process. So why do I raise that? <clears throat> On, from a grid perspective, there's a lot of attention about keeping it reliable and even resilient. Um, and, and so they are requiring that things work when they're supposed to work. The question is, as we move through um, this change and this transition, how do we retain that across a footprint? Uh, meaning, on the other side of the gas valve, as an example. We're now talking about real-time delivery of, of fuel to power plants as supporting a grid. Um, uh, the polar, polar vortex taught us that that can be an issue, especially um, when a lot of our power plants require gas pressure at certain values if they, before they can run. So um, we, we really need to make sure as we transition to more gas, as an example, um, that we do have things in place that will allow an infrastructure in place, especially in our part of the country where the infrastructure was primarily built for winter home heating. Uh, many of um, the generators in this space uh, are on interruptible supply. Uh, some of them have moved now with the capacity performance uh, metric uh, to uh, dual fuel, which is a help. That's not the total answer in my view. I'd be happy to answer questions about that later. Um, but um, uh, so uh, the reason why uh, NERC pays so close attention are, are two. There is an, a, a real threat from a cyber perspective. We get at AP thousands of attacks every day on our system, uh, people trying to infiltrate and do something. Um, whether it's really bad or just sort of bad, um, it remains to be seen. But we, are, we, we have almost an entire floor of folks dressed, addressing cyber today. NERC requires us to keep way ahead of the cyber issues. Um, and again, um, that needs to apply across the grid. So essentially what I'm saying is, as we transition, it could be, if the market didn't have the benefit of this kind of existing generation mix that it was blessed with, um, it could be that the gas pipe is equal to the transmission line from a dispatchable perspective. So when there's no gas, there's no electricity. Uh, and if that's the case, are we ready for that? Uh, are we planning in a way that will allow us to do that? Uh, it's much different having real-time flow of fuel uh, as it is having 30 days of fuel sitting next to the plant or um, you know, 18 months of fuel or so in a nuclear reactor. Um, so the auction process um, is designed around incentives for one year at a time. Uh, three years out. That's in um, a really interesting uh, model or construct, uh, much different than the traditional integrated resource plan construct where we were planning you know, 30, 40 years out for a 30, 40 year asset. Um, and so when we look at that model uh, and the fact that the auction process really in a sense very low bids because if you come in one dollar over um, the, uh, the line, uh, you don't get any award. So you're, you're not gonna get any re revenue for capacity. Um, that is, is driving the price, the capacity price down to a point that's making it very, very difficult uh, for, I'd say all, um, all generators but especially the coal and nuclear, and, and thus we have initi initiatives in, in some of our states that are uh, answering the call to keep some of that in the mix. Um, so capacity markets, uh, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't realize some of these issues I just raised for us. And so how do we do that? Um, is gonna be really, really important to protect the reliability and re resiliency that I mentioned before. So I did mention that uh, a natural gas power plant can be very, very reliable, 98%, but if it's put in a system that can't support that reliability, can't get gas to the unit, as an example, um, then you, what have you really accomplished? 
Um, so cyber is a real issue from that perspective, supply across uh, that network. Physical attack is another uh, issue that we're protecting against and audited for by NERC. Um, all of that has to be taken into account to protect this very, very valuable infrastructure we call the grid. So um, it's clear that that capacity market, the demand curve is administrative. Um, the supply curve is suppressed because of the auction process I just mentioned. Um, and, and so that's why we'd say, others are saying it's working, we'd say um, it's not. And I, I think we're finding more and more of that generation uh, being provided uh, by uh, entities that are struggling and even uh, below investment grade. Um, so the capacity performance product, uh, following the polar vortex, um, PJM, uh, rightly so, responded. Uh, we um, recognized a significant event. I remember it very well, the morning of January 7th. 2014, I woke up, uh, as I do every morning where there's high demand, looked at my cell phone and there were 25 messages overnight, warnings from PJM. The last one said lower voltage. I had never seen that message in my career and I knew we were very, very close to something very, very serious. Across the PJM footprint, the footprint there were 40,000 megawatts of um, units that were out. About half of that was uh, natural gas, some of it was coal, uh, a little bit nuclear. Um, and um, so I got into the office, uh, talked to people, and began quickly. We, we have uh, insight into uh, voltage levels and um, reactive levels. Um, that's a little comp complicated for a non-electrical uh, person. but. Um, that were clearly pointing to the fact that we were stressing the system to uh, its ultimate test. And I was sure that if we lost one more unit of an 800 megawatt size or, or larger, of which we have uh, 11, or had 11 at the time, it was a very nervous day. Um, and uh, so, I mean, you'll recall prices and so forth were, were very, very um, high, and uh, that entire week was a fairly nervous week. But um, uh, I, I say all of that to recognize that um, the capacity performance product uh, and how it's uh, answering that call, um, it, there is a penalty today if that capacity is not available uh, when there's an emergency like we had at the polar vortex. Um, but is that enough? Will that produce the generation on the day that it's needed? Um, and uh, that's an area where we still have a concern. Um, so I guess um, what I'd say at the end of the day is the capacity construct uh, is a concern. So you may have another question. Um, and we're, as a regulated utility, moving out of the merchant um, generation business. And so why, why would AEP care whether or not that market was working or not or incenting the right generation? And the reason why I care is because regardless who's generating, if they're not generating at that peak time, whether it's 20 below or 99 degrees outside, um, if it's not done in a fashion that sustains reliability and resiliency, our customers suffer. So uh, that's why it's a very high, high interest to us. So state initiatives. Um, I'll try to move through this very quickly. I had a lot of discussion about it today. Um, I think um, ZEX as an example um, are a thing that AP would support, uh, recognizing that the states need to get involved where they believe they need to get involved. We wouldn't agree uh, that our customers should foot the bill for uh, other um, companies' uh, generation, uh, but we would uh, support the state uh, having um, an initiative that would bring the generation mix they think will be the best for their state. Um, we participated in a FERC tech conference here um, recently in May, 
and um, the whole idea of state initiatives were discussed, discussed there. The key debate um, was, was real because several states that deregulated several years ago are finding that markets are not providing the generation mix that is consistent with their state objectives. Um, very good discussion, not sure what's gonna come out of that, uh, but um, it's the topic of the day here and I think a very, very important one. Um, so if we think about history and the way we've uh, for 111 years uh, planned out um, the assets that serve our customers best, um, the contrast between capacity markets and uh, integrated resource plan is quite, quite strong. Um, and and uh, from a state participation and authority perspective, we would um, recognize they are in a very good position to work with their utility uh, to create the right uh, generation footprint for their state and work through all the other issues um, that, um, whether it's emissions or other things together uh, with their utilities. <clears throat> uh, in that way, we are providing for the long term um, and uh, reliability and security issues. I will say, from an energy product perspective, um, an energy um, market perspective, it was mentioned earlier uh, by the commissioner from Pennsylvania, uh, brings a lot of value. Uh, I think the overall dispatch of a large region of units to the benefit of customer, I think is uh, a really strong uh, way to move. We've seen our customers benefit from that and we support that very much. The question is, um, what is the capacity need under um, the circumstances that uh, would yield that grid inoperable otherwise, or very uneconomic otherwise? So we're continually um, keeping our eye on that. We've uh, for 111 years. You know that number used to sound really big until uh, here a few weeks ago I looked at it and looked at my years of service and figured I'd been here for about a third of that. So it doesn't sound so big anymore. Um, but uh, so let's go back to capacity. Um, uh, vote for energy markets and how they benefit our customers and our states. Uh, but um, some of the PJN uh, PJM initiatives and capacity include um, FRR, fixed resource requirement. Um, we think that is a, a solid uh, um, self-supply plan and um, keeps us in uh, a situation where the auction process won't um, influence the generation makeup in a negative way. Um, and then PJM has a two-tiered proposal uh, that um, is interesting and we're uh, constantly evaluating and want to learn more about it and would say perhaps it's an improvement, perhaps it's not. Um, the last thing we'd want is something that would further suppress capacity markets um, and, uh, and invite the wrong generation mix uh, into our states. And that, you know, it's interesting too to consider what, um, what defines subsidized? Is it a, a, a ZEC or is it a production tax credit or is it um, rate-based generation and a market footprint? Um, RPS standards, um, not easy answers. All of them uh, need to be discussed and, and worked through. So um, capacity markets, very, very tough to see how today they're gonna bring about the, the right a capacity footprint, energy markets um, really delivering uh, a lot of value with a couple of caveats. Uh, negative LMPs due to subsidies, production tax credits, credits make it very, very difficult uh, for the other generation that's needed uh, along with that, um, the wind generation that gets the benefit of the PTCs that can drive LMPs negative. Um, that's a situation that needs to be dealt with and affects off-peak price formation quite a bit. Um, and again, can be a, a stress on uh, the generation that's there when the wind is not. 
Um, price formation, uh, very complicated pro uh, uh, process, but it can lead to some weird uh, outcomes. Um, and uh, so uh, CT units, as an example, that get um, uh, awarded but cannot dispatch and drive the energy price down. Um, and then, of course, you've already talked about today, uh, about carbon pricing. <clears throat> Being a part of that, do you introduce a shadow price or something as PJM um, is looking into? Um, I'll just say I need to hear more, learn more. We need to hear more and learn more about that. My general feeling about that is, um, again, I enjoyed the discussion earlier today. Um, it still doesn't prevent leakage issues that you were talking about earlier. It's probably... Uh, better than some answers, probably not as good as it needs to be. Um, so that's a terribly general answer. Uh, but uh, if you want to talk about more, we can talk about more in, in questions and answers. Um, concerns, needs, and challenges. Um, for the short time horizon, especially, uh, it's, it's clear that um, the capacity markets are, are going to continue to bring stress on the energy mix or the capacity mix. And that could, could bring um, uh, a, a not so good resiliency reliability issue. Um, we would argue that um, it's not a three year uh, plan. It's much longer than that. And that a capacity construct of just three years doesn't properly value, especially doesn't properly value the long-term um, attributes of some generation that wouldn't otherwise clear. And uh, so that needs to be uh, clearly understood and discussed. Um, and, you know, it's really a timing issue. The, there, there's no question the grid's gonna change. It's, it's a matter of how we transition and move through that transition uh, that, keeps the grid free of cyber, keeps the grid free of um, physical attack issues, keeps the grid free of uh, problems when there's very high polar vortex demands or very high summer demands um, and is assured that we'll operate. Uh, but we need a very, very reliable transmission transition as I've mentioned um, several times. Um, I mentioned the gas. Um, kind of advantage before. And uh, in all of these things, if you think about it, if we're adding more things at the grid's edge, which I'm in favor of, and I'm getting ready to talk about it here in a moment. If we move from away from generation that holds certain attributes, uh, whether it be fuel storage or whatever else, to something else, um, it's different. And uh, it requires a lot of thought, um, a lot of um, engineering study before we move forward too quickly. Um, it's, it's more vulnerable, right? It, it doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do, it's just more vulnerable. If you think about the real-time delivery of fuel as an example, it, it's vulnerability factor, if you want to call it that, relative to having on-site storage or nuclear reactor, that's, that's a lot different. Again, not saying it can't be done, but it needs to be a part of the equation to promote reliability and resiliency uh, going forward. Um, and, and so I, I would recognize that, um, and I mentioned this before, when I talked about our future, AP is all about transforming and changing. Uh, you can see that in, in the generation profile of what we're looking to, to uh, put in place for our customers going forward, and by the way, the 8,000 megawatts I mentioned <clears throat> of renewables in our plan, 2,000 of that we're suggesting should be advanced through this wind catcher project in Oklahoma uh, to take advantage of the PTCs. Um, and um, I'd love to talk about that project more if you have questions about it. Um, so more and more, to me, it's a very exciting time. It's an exciting time to engage with our commissions and our customers in what's best. So um, at AP, for the first time, I think, in its 111-year history, 
uh, two years ago, we stood up an enterprise technology council that looked at the value stream from fuel in to the outlet on the wall or the fixture on the ceiling or the, uh, the HVAC system in the basement and asked, how can we improve that? How can we improve the efficiency of that system? Where is it best to place assets that will bring the most customer value? And what brings the most um, risk to it? Uh, so we've been hard at work and um, have come up with a number of initiatives and uh, are happy to report that um, some progress with those. We will have, as an example, uh, a 10 megawatt virtual power plant in place in Indiana by the end of this year. Um, and uh, if you have questions about that, I'd um, be happy to uh, give you my perspective on it. But it, it engages customers and utility in a way that um, lowers the need for generation, uh, increases the efficiency of that value stream, uh, and bringing overall value. Uh, and I would say really um, the utility uh, is in the unique position to integrate and optimize. Um, you know, as an example, uh, if uh, we had one entity uh, in our system aggregate for this community, another one for that community, this one for that community, um, you'd see benefits for each of those customers in those groups but would you see benefits across that whole value stream? And the answer is likely no, because you're not controlling the peak of those assets at all those different aggregates. Um, and therefore, when the load peak does increase, you've got to keep investing back all the way to the power plant to provide for that. So it's a, it's a value stream analysis that uh, we think we need to look very, very closely at and advocate for, for the benefit of our customers and the grid going forward. So that concludes my prepared remarks. I'm happy to take questions. Any questions? And how were the cannolis? I'll ask the first one. Good. There was one that came in over Twitter while you were speaking. Um, to some extent, you. You've covered it, but let's think of it as a follow-up then. What would an appropriately designed capacity construct look like? Is there, a, is there a compromise? So I guess you want to get more specific than you've already gotten? Um, yeah, it, it, I probably should have the answer to that question since I raised the issue. Uh, it, it would look a lot like uh, an, an integrated resource plan, the state and the utility working together. Uh, to bring um, the right generation mix, recognizing all the components, the inputs and outputs. Um, it, I think integrated resource plans are going to look much different going forward. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the 4,000 megawatts of gas we have in our uh, future uh, is not going to be traditional gas. I think it might look a lot more distributed and allow us to bring more resiliency uh, closer to the customer moving more and more assets closer to the grid's edge to raise that um, efficiency of the value stream. So um, in order to do that effectively, uh, it's hard to design markets to uh, advocate for all of that and, and price all of that, but it, it could be done in a, uh, in a forum where states and utilities are working together. And you, in taking the benefit of an energy market, as an example, um, along the way. Other questions? All right. Hi, thanks for the uh, talk. I thought it was really great. Um, so my question is more so surrounding, uh, I'm not sure of what your generation mix is, but you said the kind of best case would be, and, and I would love for you to answer too at the end of the, before you start the rest. Um, but you, you mentioned uh, particularly natural gas and concerns over supply and infrastructure. And it made me think a little bit because then I thought, well, there probably are similar issues with respect to coal or nuclear to mm. a certain degree. And in addition, even when it comes to renewable, there's still transmission, which right. one might say there could be potential risks to vulnerability, uh, which could also create supply disruption. So I was wondering if, uh, given your extensive experience, 
um, that there might be some particular aspects, is it the interactions between both markets or uh, where the resources are extracted because clearly um, you can extract natural gas and natural gas reserves are and then there could be pipeline bottlenecks, for example. Yeah. Uh, so so that, I, would, I would really appreciate your insights on that. And also, uh, if you could start off with your overall generation mix too, because that also helps to inform uh, the history of your company and why uh, you perceive uh, the, uh, such, a, such a, a generation mix in such a way. Uh, okay, a generation mix today uh, in the mid 40s for coal around 30 for gas, um, a small percentage nuclear, about 7% nuclear. Um, we, have, we lump hydro in with renewables. It's uh, in the mid-teens today. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much the, the footprint there. Um, and then getting to your question about uh, coal's vulnerabilities or nuclear's vulnerabil vulnerabilities are um, are real as well. They're just different. And thanks for um, recognizing the level of experience. I think it was a polite way to say, and you know, I'm really old, but I get, I get, um, but that, no, no, I, I'm teasing. <clears throat> um, so I was um, involved in the early 90s, mid 90s, in a situation that did have uh, ramifications for the grid when the Ohio River froze over and we couldn't get barges to our coal plants. And so um, the difference being in that case, we started with 30 days plus and we had 30 days to find the answer. Um, it's, it's much different, right, with a, a more real-time delivery uh, of, uh, of fuel. So um, it does give you the benefit of more time um, and, and the same is true of nuclear. Did that answer your question? Uh, short, uh, more dynamic and short, uh, the time steps are much smaller. So that's right. It's, it's so, those dynamics that make it. So, uh, you know, if, if the compressor for that pipe fails for whatever reason on the day where I'm extracting everything I can out of it to reach full load on a natural gas combined cycle, that could have an impact right away. Um, so, again, don't hear me saying that it can't work. Um, hear me saying we need to make sure it does work when it needs to work um, before we, you know, throw all of our our eggs into that one basket. Um, I've worked at quite a bit in natural gas, and I just actually wanted to reinforce that point too. So sometimes I perceive, you know, you think of it through where the natural gas hubs are, for example, and if there were a disruption to a major hub, um, that should also be, you know, what would happen in those cases if, you know, as we transition to a much more dom uh, natural gas dominated market. So. That would be that would be a problem. Oh, uh, Sarah Jordan, I just got asked to say who I was. I'm Sarah Jordan. I'm a Johns Hopkins faculty member. Hi, Mark Labs, Modern Energy. Um, I was curious, as you were thinking about resiliency and reliability, how do you think about distributed energy resources in trying to address that issue, whether it's storage generation, efficiency, or demand response? Yeah, so um, uh, I think about it a lot. And I think it's something that um, our states and their utilities need to think about a lot. Uh, as I mentioned, I kind of hinted to this. Uh, a lot of that 4,000 megawatts of gas generation could be placed in a very strategic way um, to bring more resiliency at a substation or near a substation. And if you combine that um, with battery storage and uh, some solar, as an example, uh, that's integrated at a lower voltage, um, it's a pretty interesting package. It brings resiliency, it brings green, it brings um, uh, a fantastic responsive uh, system to a more local region uh, and still allows it to work um, cohesively with the bigger grid. Um, I mentioned the virtual power plant uh, earlier. So one way to think about that is if as this building's HVAC came on this morning, there was an infinitesimally small voltage drop in the system. Um, that voltage drop was immediately met all the way back through the distribution substation, through the transmission system, to a power plant somewhere 
that open a steam valve or a gas valve in a really small way. So that whole system is responding to the load needs of this building uh, and the building next door. And, the, and as they're all coming on at the same time, our units are all between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. especially, they're all opening these valves and meeting that pressure, that need, that voltage and frequency need. What a virtual power plant would say uh, is we need generation quality controls on the load in. And so we're installing devices in Target stores and schools and Walmarts and Walgreens that will allow us to dispatch their load in a way that the customer barely realizes it. Uh, so we take a third of the lights out in the grocery store or uh, the Walgreens. We pre-cool uh, one building so that when uh, another building's HVAC comes on, they don't have to come on and we stagger that. We're the, we're the conductor of the symphony, if you will, which lowers the peak need and allows us to optimize that value stream I talked about earlier. So um, we, we're very bullish on um, creating more value at the grid's edge closer to the customer at or near the meter. Does that answer your question? And that's a lot of work that I mentioned that Enterprise Technology Council. Uh, that's a lot of the work that Energy uh, Enterprise Technology Council has been doing. Hi, uh, that's quite loud. Uh, Madeline Fleischer, I'm an attorney with the Environmental Law and Policy Center. Um, and actually, follow-up question about the virtual power plant. And I don't mean this as a quiz, so if you don't know. <laughs> um, but I was wondering if um, that is cost justified on its own merits? Is it more of a pilot type effort? If so, what pilots went into getting yeah. there? Yeah, so uh, it's moving into the EEDR space right now. Um, we think there's a better model for it, and I'll leave that up to our regulatory experts to, to move us through that. Um, but it, to, if you think about it, it's, it's very, it's generation quality DR and EE. Um, so uh, the assets today, because they're bringing benefits to all customers and lowering the need for peak load, um, would be rate-based. Um, and the customers then um, benefit from an energy reduction. They, they like being part of a green, by the way, it's very, very green. Uh, you're lowering emissions, lowering load, um, and, and really not having uh, the disruption of uh, building anything on, on a site. So um, it's taking advantage of making that value stream more efficient. That answer kind of, sort of? Uh, I was wondering uh, sort of where that is in the stage of saying, okay, we have, you know, a future capacity need. We're going to deploy a virtual PowerPoint. Yeah. Is, is this like an experiment yeah. or you're doing this now? Well, so I, I would say it's in pilot mode at the moment, but I think it could be a, a big part of that um, uh, future integrated resource plan as an example. Um, so I, 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 we, we want to make sure it works and, and it truly is generation quality, uh, and, but it's a, I'm not suggesting it's the answer, um, but I am suggesting it's one of the answers to bring uh, efficiency to this value stream, customer value, um, and uh, more resiliency because of the, the distributed nature of it. Hi, uh, Jeff Plewis with Charles River Associates, and I'll, I'll be brief because I know you're pushed for time here, but um, I'm going to push you one step farther on the capacity, the ideal capacity construct yes. idea. So you get to the point where it's, like you said, you go to, you want to be able to have states affect their IRP goals through some kind of a capacity construct. And in, in my mind, that means choosing resources, choosing technology types that meet certain goals, and then finding a way to compensate them for their costs through a capacity construct. Um, I guess the question is, where's the role for the market at that point if that's yeah. kind of the con construct, or does it exist anymore if every state's doing that same thing? Yeah, I, you know, it could uh, likely repra replace the capacity market. The energy market would still be very real. 
um, because that's not your focus in the integrated resource plan. It's having the capacity available uh, there that's going to meet the needs of your particular state. Uh, you still want to dispatch economically and take advantage of that for your customers. So it's a combination of um, a state plan with uh, perhaps with an existing capacity market. Again, I, I don't have the total answer here. I'm just from my years of experience and the concerns and, and needs I see going forward about preserving reliability, economic value, um, resiliency, and, and recognizing this entire value stream of, uh, that brings value to our customers. We need to be very cognizant of what we place. It's not a winner in a market that gets placed there. It's what really needs, that meets the needs of that um, network for the next several years. I don't know if that helps or not, but there's a lot of discussion yet to have. Well, great, Mark. Thank you very much for yeah. your presentation and the questions. Please give Mark a hand. Thank you. And the next.